and uh, to speak about uh, a topic that some of us have been talking about, believing in, and, and wanting to propagate over the last few years, all of us who have believed in technology and what technology is showing us today. So as, as the chairperson mentioned, the previous plenary session also had speakers uh, talking about glycemic variability. And glycemic variability is now coming forth as, as the missing part of the quadrant. For the longest time, we've been speaking about getting your fasting under control, your postprandial and A1C, but something has been missing. And that fourth dimension, which completes the quadrant, which completes the cube, which gives us better insight into the actual control or the sugar management in a diabetic, is the glycemic variability. So over the next 18 minutes or so, I'll talk about glycemic variability, moving on to the importance of postprandial hyperglycemia and how it contributes to glycemic variability and its harmful effects. And then moving on to how Vogli Bose, uh, the preferred AGI, helps us in this. So this is how a normal glucose glycemic homeostasis is in a healthy individual. The blood sugar averages around 90 to 100. Maximum usually does not exceed 165, maintained above 55 at most times, but it's never a flat line. So the sugar continues to move and fluctuate in every individual, even in a healthy individual and it's never going to be flat. The fall in plasma glucose of as little as 20 will suppress the release of insulin. A rise of about 10 milligram person will initiate the secretion mm -hmm. of insulin. So that's your normal glycemic homeostasis. Can I have this moving? In the meanwhile, can you move it to the next slide till this works? Give me more. Yes, sir. Yes, give me more. <laughs> right. So glycemic variability is not just chronic hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the entire nadir and zenit, the top and low of sugar in a day. It's the hyperglycemia. It's an, and the hypoglycemia. So to define glycemic variability, it is the swing and the movement of sugars throughout the day, which is called as glycemic variability. And it has various means of measuring. So for quite some time, we've been talking about reduce the glycemic variability. Glycemic variability is harmful. The up and downs are harmful. Let's try and maintain closer to the, the, the average level. But how do we really measure glycemic variability? And are there ways and simple means of doing that is again what we'll be looking at. Next. So within the, the profile of the sugar, chronic, no, let's go back and can I have that thing in my hand, please? Can we go back? Okay, let me handle this, please, thank you. Right, so chronic hyperglycemia versus frequent glycemic variability. So what's now coming to forth is that various studies have shown that somebody has chronic hyperglycemia, if somebody's sugar says stay around the 200, 220 level most of the time, this particular individual is less at danger for developing diabetic complications as compared to somebody who's going high and low. So this variability between hyper and hypoglycemia is in fact going to be more harmful in producing oxidative stress and causing endothelial cell damage, giving rise to this variability and the complications. The excess daily glycemic fluctuations can be seen still coming out to be having the same A1C. So if you see somebody could have a profile of sugar over a 24 hour period in the red mark, that means sugars are fluctuating like in a healthy individual. At the same time, somebody might have the sugars fluctuating really up and down. This variability, in spite of this variability, the HbA1C can be seven in both these patients. So which is telling us that just going by A1C for the longest time that we've been doing that or by doing just SMBG, maybe three, four, seven readings in a day hasn't really given us the actual picture of what's been happening. And these postprandial peaks, right, will increase the risk of micro and microvascular damage. Minor hypoglycemic symptoms might be missed in these patients and it adversely impacts the quality of life. In fact, today when I spoke about the quadrant and the cube of including glycemic variability, there's a group trying to work of talking about a pentad. 
That means diabetes is not only about a triad. There was a move to move to a, a, a quadrant of improvement, and now we are talking about pentad of improvement. That means look at your fasting, look at postprandial, look at A1C, look at glycemic variability and quality of life. So when you've been treating a diabetic, you're not treating the sugars. You're talking about treating an individual and getting that person to feel better. And hence, quality of life, which improves when you start getting insight into how their sugars are fluctuating, what could be missed in your conventional ways of monitoring sugar, will be able to change this quality of life that is being missed. So the measurements of glycemic variability, how do we really measure? One of the most used measurements is MAGE, that is mean amplitude of glycemic excursions. It's hourly obtained blood glucose values over 48 hour period. CGM, uh, continuous glucose monitoring of any nature uses MAGE. Standard deviation, it's the easiest method using even something like as low as seven point SMBG. The interday variation can also be calculated by standard deviation of fasting glucose, but there we tend to miss the rest of the day variability. Then you have the MOD, the absolute mean of daily differences. The interday glycemic variability measurement supplements the MAGE and mean blood glucose. It was again developed using the early blood samples during a 48 hour period. It ignores excursions of less than one standard deviation. All these are various means of measuring, whether it is conga, that is continuous overlapping net glycemic action, it is purely CGM based tool to look at the glycemic variability or the coefficient of variation. There are some other means of actually checking the variability, the, the glycemic variability, the M value. Again, by getting six SMBG values, you can start calculating the M value. The M value is basically zero, and with glycemic variability, the M value increases. The more variable an individual is, the higher will be the M value. And then the serum levels of 1,5-anhydroglucitol. This is probably the most known ones for those who've been working in the clinical research area. Uh, also, now commercially available test as Glucomark, uh, maybe soon in India that will be available for us to measure. So this, the principle of 1,5-AG is it's a marker of glycemic excursion. Its absorption is inhibited by excessive secretion of urinary glucose. The higher the plasma glucose concentration, the lower the 1,5-anhydroglucitol. So most new drugs which are looking at decreasing the postprandial peaks tend to do 1,5-AG as a marker of how successful that drug has been. Lower the AG, uh, uh, would mean higher the, uh, higher the plasma excursion. And it's predominantly useful when you're trying to assess the, the variability below the A1C of 8. And these are the complex measurements. So if somebody really wants to look into how to measure these, we know today that all these definitions of standard uh, glycemic variability that I mentioned was it standard deviation, coefficient of variation, MAGE, all of these have a formula to calculate it, which at times gets difficult. And hence, Tools like the CGM, tools like the AGP that we're talking about simplify and give us this variability in a more easy to understand manner, something that I should be able to show. So glycemic variability, I've been talking about how to measure it, but is there really a need? Shall we prevent it? Glycemic variability has deleterious effects on the endothelial cells. Exposure of cell culture to fluctuating glucose levels leads to increased cell apoptosis. Plausible evidence exists for glycemic variability and micro and micro complications and even death. So we know that when we have not been looking at glycemic variability, we've been happy with our patients fasting, postprandial, and just A1C, we probably haven't been doing our job well enough. Oxidative stress is also present with glycemic variability. So there is enough evidence to show that GV causes oxidative stress. Several markers have been used to assess oxidative stress. Problem is there's short half-life for adequate measurement. However, whenever measured, it has shown a clear linear relation with glycemic variability. So markers of oxidative stress like the urinary isoprostanes have provided evidence that whenever there is variability in an individual, this leads to more oxidative stress. Mage and oxidative stress, the mean amplitude of glycemic excursion is the original medical measurement of variability as I mentioned, and still considered to be the best available clinical metric. Mage computes the average height of gl glucose excursions that exceed the standard deviation. It includes only the peak to nadir or nadir to peak excursion, whichever happens first in the day. And this again shows a clear linear relations between MAGE and oxidative stress. All glucose parameters need control. So according to this model, a global anti-diabetic therapeutic strategy should be aimed at reducing the values of all the three coordinates. That means the entire volume of the cube. And as I said now, 
we'll go beyond the volume of the cube and also add quality of life, which has its own different measurements. So A1C, what have we been doing so far? When we talk about monitoring our patient sugars, do SMBG, do a fasting postprandial from the laboratory, and do an HbA1c. We have now reached a stage that large number of our patients, or predominantly a good number of patients, are doing A1c. There would still be centers, there would still be towns, areas, rural areas where patients are not able to afford A1c. And here we are already talking about the limitation of an A1c. And what are these limitations? It's a 90-day average. Thus, what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis is not known to us. Unless, unlike thought earlier, it's not an exact weighted average over the last three months. The last one month prior to when you're doing it will have almost 50 to 60 percent weightage. And this goes on decreasing as to the farther the day you go from your A1C value. What therapy do we change? If I tell you the individual's A1C is 8.2, does it give you enough insight to decide what I should change? Shall I be changing drugs in the morning? Shall I be changing the timing? Fasting, postprandial, what is really bothering this patient's sugars? So it's not giving us enough insight into that. A1C, of course, also tends to get affected by various medical conditions, be it uh, anemia, hemoglobinopathies, and more importantly, poor lab standardization for this test and uh, errors in, in measurement. So that itself is a big limiting factor. And these, of course, there's the listed drugs which tend to affect. And you'll see some of these are very commonly used drugs in our patients, which could be affecting the A1C value on which we have been relying so much. So to give you an example of what the CGM values look like and how we can see the standard deviation. So this is, this is something that I would call as an individual's glycemic profile, uh, each color representing a, a single day over a 24 hour period. And this is a reasonably good profile. This person has remained fine through the day slightly increase on a day or two post breakfast, not much of increase, so hardly gone beyond 200 on most days, and we'll be able to identify the standard deviation. So if you want to start looking at a CGM picture, start looking at the standard deviation. It is largely believed that a standard deviation below 40 or 35 would be considered good, and as the SD value goes high, that's indicative of much more variability leading to the various problems. And this is what a bad glycemic profile will look like. So this is all over the place. When you see a uh, CGM reading of this nature, it's telling you that this person needs help. We need to completely change therapy, get into the dietary changes, get into the therapy changes. And this, we can see a standard deviation of 76. So this is what we don't want in our patients. And unless we do a CGM of some nature, we will not be able to identify what's been missing in this individual. Both these patients could have had similar A1Cs. <clears throat> Coming down to postprandial, why is that harmful? Independent risk factor for macrovascular disease. It's associated with increased intima media thickness, associated with increased risk of retinopathy, so both micro and macrovascular complications. It causes oxidative stress, inflammation, and endothelial dysfunction. Decreased myocardial blood flow volume and myocardial blood flow associated with impaired cognitive function in the elderly. There has been various studies like the DECODE and the DECODA analysis, which was the Asian part of that. It analyzed baseline and two-hour post-meal glucose data from prospective cohort studies, including a large number of men and women of European and Asian origin. This analysis found and told us that a two-hour plasma glucose was a much better indicator or predictor of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality than just fasting plasma glucose. Risk of coronary heart disease, CHD with postprandial hyperglycemia. So again, shown by in various studies, one of them listed here. Postprandial hyperglycemia contributes not only to microvascular, but to the macrovascular complications. Only a modest increase in the post-glucose challenge of glucose levels can significantly increase, as we can see, as the glucose values tends to go up, the percentage of chance of uh, coronary heart disease goes much higher. So postprandial hyperglycemia, unless we start controlling our patients postprandial hyperglycemia, we know we'll never get our patients to target. The earlier Monier paper showed about that if the A1C is less than 7.9, that is where postprandial becomes important. We know enough Indian and Asian data showing that even to get A1Cs below 8.5, unless you start tackling the postprandial hyperglycemia, you will not be able to achieve these targets. Relative risk for death increases with 2-hour blood glucose irrespective. So even if your fasting is good, but your postprandial continues to be on the higher side, it is increasing your risk of complications. 
again showed the uh, similar relationship between PPG and microvascular complications through the Kumamoto study. So the targets for postprandial glucose and monitoring, 2-hour postprandial glucose should ideally not exceed 140. One might say there can be a range, you can have 120 to 160. SMBG should be considered for monitoring postprandial glucose till other methods become available and more prevalent. Efficacy of the treatment regimen should be monitored as frequently as needed to guide the therapy. And these are recommendations by the IDF for tar targeting the postprandial and monitoring. And this is the IDF treatment algorithm. In 2015, we tend to talk more about the ADA ESD algorithm. But for a lot of nations across the world, IDF has more relevance and it, its recommendations have more relevance. And we know that IDF, when it comes to even Indian uh, uh, clinical means of giving importance to postprandial hyperglycemia, the IDF recommendations have been far more closer to home. And if you see the IDF recommendations, it will talk about after lifestyle along with metformin, on the other option being sulfonylurea or alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Especially in India where we have a large carbohydrate based diet, uh, the use of alpha glucosidase is, sub, uh, is much, much higher, both here and in countries like China where again alpha glucosidase is a big part of their anti-diabetic treatment. So all across the spectrum, they have recommended the use of alpha glucosidase where required. Voglibose may be a candidate for an anti-atherosclerotic drug because it's been found to reduce total cholesterol and triglycerides, increases HDL, reduces systemic inflammation and arterial stiffness, and reduces the carotid intimal medial thickness by 0.0689 uh, millimeters per year, which is a significant means of doing that. In this Diana study, Voglibose, significant increase in number of patients. So in this study, they had three groups, patients put on lifestyle, patients put on Voglibose, and patients put on uh, repaglinide. So, uh, nataglinide, sorry. So in, in these three groups, it, we realized that those patients who were put on to Voglibose, the rise in postprandial sugar was much lesser and less atheroma progression seen in the group of patients who were on uh, uh, Voglibose. It was good, and those who were on nataglinide, it was much higher. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors reduces the progression of carotid intima media thickness, so again showing its beneficial effects there. Voglibose has been found to actually decrease the visceral adipose tissue, and the ratio between the visceral adipose tissue and the subcutaneous adipose tissue has been improvised by the usage of Voglibose, again adding another perspective and a beneficial angle to the use of Voglibose in our regular therapy. Voglibose, coming down to the glycemic variability part, it lowers the daily glycemic excursions and inhibits overworking of the pancreatic beta cells, allows it to get some rest. Compared to gliptins and most other drugs, all of the slopes of glucose elevation were significantly lower in a head-on study between Voglibose and Cetagliptin. So again, telling the importance that if you're going to be looking at decreasing glycemic variability, and I'm glad to see that at this Congress, there are at least a dozen or more talks talking about glycemic variability at various forums. And in years to come, we'll see GV coming up as big or more important factor than HbA1c. So any drug which decreases GV is going to be helping us. How AGI has helped diabetic patients? I think it's, it's a known thing that they reduce postprandial glucose. It's their entire profile. They are weight neutral. They've been found to decrease A1c significantly. On the lipid front, they increase HDL. They decrease atherosclerosis. And the evidence showing their benefits in uh, decreasing the atheromas and the cardiovascular conditions. Within the AGIs, why might Voglibose be the preferred AGI? One, uh, in terms of taking it, the, the patient preference because of the disintegrating tablet that they have, the mouth dissolving tablets with most Voglibose brands have, it's been found that patients prefer to take it. It of course improves the A1C. Non-inferiority of Voglibose compared to a carbose on postprandial glucose values has been established across studies. And it reduces lipid levels in, 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 uh, beyond just the glycemic benefit. It has shown, Voglibo specifically has shown extra benefits on the lipid levels. And it's more potent and a tolerant AGI. And that's because Voglibo has 190 to 270 times higher inhibitory activity on maltose and sucrose than the other AGI. And that's the basis of why Voglibo as an alpha glucosidase inhibitor works better than the other existing alpha glucose inhibitors and hence probably the preferred AGI today. Now, to finally finish my talk, I would want to show more recent data coming from my center. So th when I received the, the uh, invite and uh, uh, the topic for today's uh, talk, I said, let me see with the new flash glucose monitoring available, the Abbott Libre, what can we do? So we, we put a patient on uh, the freestyle Libre 
And this is the first three-day profile which showed the patient having severe glycemic excursions, especially post-breakfast. And that's another point I would like to tell everybody here. And large number of CGMs that we've been doing over the last three years, post-breakfast has turned out to be a far bigger problem in a lot of Indian patients than post-lunch or post-dinner. And that's the ignored part. So even till the time you get yourself to do regular uh, CGM, start looking at post-breakfast as that's a bigger contributor than post-lunch and post-dinner, even for all those who have a minimal breakfast. So post-breakfast is what we see was much higher and these variability. On the same patient who visited me third day uh, while on the AGP, we had a look at the data and we added Voglibos to this patient, continued the rest of the therapy, whatever the patient was taking, 